I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. We've been introduced to Adam Swap. If you'll recall the uh, Adam Swap story, it's, uh, you can find it on sacredgroves.net, uh, more of his story, and it's just a very compelling one, and we've learned about his principles and uh, his conviction, and eventually driving with some other extenuating circumstances, some some actions against the law and against the community in Marion, and uh, which landed him in prison. And that's about where we're at now. So, um, Adam, thanks for joining me again. My pleasure. And uh, so you're sentenced to 30 years. Uh, again, we might mention, you mentioned last time about the potential plea bargain that you had at nine, nine years, but because of principles and uh, pride in what you were doing and justification, you yeah, I would have. Go to trial and? Uh, ended up going to prison. Uh, and started off in Florida and basically been all over. I mean, from uh, Talladega, Alabama to, to Oregon, Sheridan, Oregon, and uh, San Diego, Colorado. Uh, I ended up. My last 15 years was down in Phoenix. Down in Arizona. But, During uh, this time, I guess you meet a lot of, obviously, cellmates and, and that. And a lot that of, was... Were there uh, religious people in the system? That was system? the... Yes. Yeah, there was. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a very tight-knit, uh, close community of Mormons. Yeah. Modern day and fundamentalist, and basically that was it. But going to prison uh, started to get me out of that closed. Uh, I got to meet people all over. And in the federal system, I mean, I, I met a, a Russian that was a spy. I met uh, one of my good friends that I knew for 15 years was... Uh, uh, Guy from China, Ching. He, uh, mm. I did, did really good time with him, and he's an atheist, you know. Mm. But uh, really love the guy. So it kind Very of broadened nice. your perspective of people and life and religions. This, this I was, guess. yeah. This was, uh, this was God's grace. Me going to prison. It, uh, it was the way He worked. Isn't it funny to kind of look back on? Yeah. on your life and what God's it was, done for us. I was still very, uh, very strong in what I believe, but more and more I just buried it inside me. And Through the first few years or many years? And so yeah, I, I uh, would interact with other people on their level and a lot of things uh, I'd never heard of, you know, started to come. But, you know... I will say this, I never really, that I can remember, was ever really confronted by a, a born-again Christian. Really? No. No one ever um, Nobody or? ever, no. 
There were never services that. Uh, no, that they have. Uh, they have their chapels on the. Uh, but I never went to them. Never was invited to one. Uh, what I had saw, a lot of was, uh, I saw arguments between the different denominations in prison, mm -hmm. uh, and from my Mormon mindset, it was like ah, it would just kind of proved, you know, I had the truth. And, Mormonism's true, and you're all yeah. <laughs> debating over silly stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Later, after my mind, my eyes were opened, um, and I started to meet with the Christians. Uh, wow, there's some very powerful Christians that love God with all their heart, and that made mistakes. Some of them doing life, mm. but uh, but they knew God loved them. They, yep, yeah, yeah. and knew and their I, knew their Bible. Now you spent so. 25 years, 25 and a half or so years in prison overall. Right. The first 20 or so, you were still then, uh, in, uh, what did you expect to have happen with your, were you still saying the prayer that you had told yeah. us about? I uh, always prayed that prayer, uh, even sometimes when it got real hard, but it, everything changed. Um, I finished my federal sentence <clears throat> in uh, January of 2006. It was 18 years, and I think it was minus a day or plus a day. Wow. Um, and I thought that I was going to be shipped back to Utah to do my state time. Okay, so there was a federal sentence and a state sentence. Yes. Okay. So, so in, the, in the state sentence, I had a 1 to 15 year sentence. It's an indeterminate sentence determined by a parole board. Mm -hmm. and, but I had a 30 year cap between the two sentences. So you'd done 18. I'd done so 18. You knew you were probably, most you were going to do is 12, I right. guess. Okay. So here I am waiting to go back to Utah. Well, they had an interstate compact agreement with the state of Arizona, and I was shipped to Arizona State. Mm. And I, I, nobody would tell me why. Why am I here? And finally, uh, this one lady showed me one piece of paper and said, uh, you're here on an interstate compact agreement, you have no parole, you're going to do 15 years right here. And they put me in max. And I'd never done time in max. I had never gotten a write up in the federal system. And there was no justification to put me in max. Yeah. But once again, that was God's grace. They shipped me over to a place called The Walls. And it's an old prison. It's painted battleship gray. And uh, at the time, uh, Jeffs, the Warren Jeffs, Warren Jeffs uh, was in the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, for his polygamy. For his, here you are. A right. I'm, so I'm a fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. And they found out that I was a fundamentalist. I didn't hide it, but they equated me with. Warren Jeffs. Now yours was not part of his program no, at all. We're, but we were independent, so yeah. we didn't belong to anybody. Yeah. But subsequently, because of that, they wanted me off the yard. And off the yard, and when you're in Max, you don't move uh, out of your cell without, you, you back up to the cell, put your hands through the food tray, f food slot, and you get cuffed, and then there's four cops that take you around. Oh my goodness. And but they still can get to you. The inmates basically run the joint. And uh, my neighbor, they wanted me off the yard. And off the yard, they wanted me moved um, because of the whole Warren Jeffs thing and thinking that I was part of his, yeah. his thing. So I had borrowed a book from my neighbor through the bars around the side. And I was giving it back to him. He grabbed hold of my arm and almost broke it. And subsequently, uh, I was moved, and that was the lowest point. It, everything went downhill from then. Um, my life was threatened, and all this pride that I'd had in my stand um, abandoned me. Mm. And they knew who I was on the yard and wanted me. And 
Were you scared? I was scared. I was, yeah. And I wasn't only scared, but I was, I was disillusioned. I was, you know, I thought I was doing God's work and, you know. And where was God in all this? <laughs> yeah, I remember sitting in the lieutenant's office in a tiny little cage. Uh, they put you, it's about this big. And just had my, my head in my hands. And I, I remember the captain saying, what's he doing in here? Hmm. And they went and put me in a cell after that. It was the most foul rank cell you've ever seen in your life. There was a hole next to the toilet on the floor that was a backup hole, and there was toilet paper and feces on the floor. Hmm. And the mattress was, it was horrible. Um, it was just, it was horrible. It stunk. Oh my goodness. And I was in there three days. I had no blanket. There was one little window in the metal door, and uh, God was really breaking me down. He had brought and, you so far along, I thought, okay, I've got to... And I'm just like, I don't know what's going on with my life. And that paper kept going through my head, there's no parole, you're going to do 15 years here. Hmm. They finally moved me to another cell on the same type of cell, but it was upstairs. They eventually shut those down because so many people committed suicide in them. Oh my goodness. Um, I had an officer tell me later. But in this other cell, this might seem kind of strange, but on the wall there was just the way it had been painted. I could see this gulf, and on, on it it was it wasn't a painting and nobody had done it. It was an accident. It was just the way it had been painted from. And it, I saw these people on the other side of this gulf and they, they were peaceful and they were in white. And Did you just imagine this? You, you could see it. I oh, mean, it was, the it was kind the... of a, like they had painted the floor, the cement floor, mm -hmm. and it, it slopped up on the Trailed wall. or something? Something. Or painted, yeah. And... I was on the wrong side. And I remember seeing that and it's just like, dear God, I, I just, I was getting broke down lower and lower. Finally I went to another cell and uh, it was just like all hope was gone. I'd been there days and a lot of things happened. Uh, but finally, I, I just I found myself face down on that floor, and I just crying out to God, help me, help mm -hmm. me, God, help me. All my pride was gone, everything. I was a broken man. And uh, I didn't see Jesus, but I know he was in that cell. And he said to me, Adam, I want you to read the New Testament as if you've never read it before. There's no preconceived notions. And I want you to believe every word of it. And this was his message to you. That was it. It wasn't, I wanted to open the doors. I was praying for the walls to fall down. I was praying for the angels to come. I was praying for all the Mormonism, the Something power. <clears throat> It was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. That was the message. That's what I got. I, I'd read the New Testament. I hadn't believed every word of it. Yeah. And I did have preconceived notions. And I said, okay, God, I will. And I started reading it. And the first thing that I came to was my conduct. And that was in Matthew 5:44 that I'm to love my enemies and I'm to do good to them that persecute me. And it was like, wow, I didn't do any of that. And I just, every, every page convicted me. 
Mm. And there, it just wasn't immediate. I wasn't just, it was a, it was a process of me actually coming out. There was, uh, I had a TV in the cell and uh, one of the stations was uh, TBN. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was, you know, I just that a lot of pomp, you know, the yeah. televangelist stuff. Send but, me money and you'll get but a blessing. boy, there were a few of them there yeah. that they knew Jesus. And I started finding out who Jesus was in the New Testament. It wasn't just a attack on to the end of your prayer so it got to heaven. Um, especially in the book of John. Yeah. I love the book of John. John chapter 6. Basically, you have to feast on Jesus. He's your meal. He's your life. He's the bread out of heaven. He's the eternal water. The And that was my... Uh, Oh, so I, I, I saw the different, some of the different preachers on there. Never in a million years would I have watched a station like that, but when you're alone in a cell. That's what you have to watch. Yeah, and I saw on the news, I saw this girl. She was Muslim, a teenager, and she was strapped with dynamite. And it was one of those films that she was believed in her, uh, in Islam, you know, in, in the Quran. And it was just like a revelation to me. Just because you believe in something to the point you're willing to give your life doesn't mean you're right. And that's where I was at. And you knew that experience. And see, and, and, and in Mormonism, it's all about conviction of your spirit doesn't come back to what does the Word of God say? Yeah. Do you know something's right or not by the Spirit? Well, I know by the Spirit. You'll hear that in Mormonism. Oh, oh I, I, so I, you feel. I, yeah. It's fine. Whatever you're telling me, that's fine. But I know by the Spirit's told me. Yeah. And as I got more and more into my studies in the Bible, you know, Jeremiah, about the heart is deceitfully wicked, and in Proverbs, how a man that trusts his own heart is a fool. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't know that in Mormonism. You, you don't know that. That your, your evidence and conviction of truth is how you feel inside your chest. Yeah, burning in the bosom. Yeah. yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. The Spirit does speak to you, but it is confirmed. It is the Word of God is... That takes precedence. If God placed his word even above his own name, yeah. um, our feelings in our heart had better conform to that word. But, of course, in Mormonism, we don't believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God. Yeah. Just as and, far as it's translated correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a big deal for me when God told me to believe every single word of it. Well, you had to put that in per your Mormon perspective, didn't you? Well, I, you know what? I had a lot of uh, cogn cognitive dissonance. I had, at that point, I had a lot of different beliefs on my belief window. Yeah. And a lot of them contradicted each other. But the, I firmly believe that Jesus told me to believe the New Testament. And so, Every word. yep, and that changed my life. That was what brought me to a relationship with God, a true relationship. And one of the last things that I, uh, in my coming out, was the belief that Jesus was God. That was a hard one for me. But I mean, John 1 1, yeah. um, about the Word. The Word was. Were made you flesh. teaching yourself, basically? Yes. Or did you have it any? was. I had nothing. I had the New Testament. And it's so great since I've been out because I got the internet now. Mm -hmm. But it was the and Word. And yeah. so much of it, I, I can go back through my notes in here 
and I have little notes that come from the Mormon perspective. Um, how does this work? How does this work? Because I was still Mormon, even though the Lord told me that. Um, and they started, it's, this just doesn't make sense, but I have to, this has got to be number one. This has got to take precedent. So I would discard things or pigeonhole them. And I don't really remember fully when I said, you know what? It was when I was out. You know, I, everything else was second to the New Testament from that point on. But I still held on to a lot of stuff, like in Mark 9, the blind man. He says, I see men as trees walking. Um, and then Jesus laid his hands on him again, and he fully saw. Well, a lot of the stuff that I learned was, I don't understand it. I kind of see it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to continue to believe this over everything else that I know. And when I was true to that, the shackles did fall off. And... I fully came to a saving relationship with Jesus, who is God, the creator of everything. And now I know why his sacrifice was so wonderful. And I learned about grace. And when I talk about grace, Mormons don't know what grace is. They have no idea. I did not know what grace was at all until I started reading about it. Paul spelling it out. And I had to read and reread. Uh, Romans, Romans chapter 3, uh, it was... Isn't that fantastic? Oh, just... I mean, even today, I, I'll weep when I read it, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just amazing because it's, it's something God, God has to give it to you. Because yeah. I'd read it before and it was like, oh yeah, oh, that's boring, you know, <laughs> not as boring as a Book of Mormon, but... <laughs> So you were in this now, this was about a period of six years then between the time you were broken completely yeah. and the time you yeah. ended up getting out in July of 2013, right? Yeah. And how many times did you read the Bible? Um, I always had this book with me everywhere I went. Yeah. I slept with it next to me in my bunk. Everybody saw me with it. And uh, I read it 88 times. Yeah, and I and I and I I don't say that out of pride. No, I say it out of out of the joy that I find in God's word and fully believing God's word. Yeah. That will bring. You, you believe God's word. You fully believe it. If you'll embrace God's word, it'll bring you out of any false religion. It'll bring you into a true true relationship with Him. Well, that's. You've mentioned a couple of things here about the, about the Bible and, and the fact that as Mormons we just didn't really trust it. I mean, I remember on my mission I had underlined a bunch of scriptures, but none of the scriptures that I would fall to now or right. that I think right. are important now. It um, was. Uh, it's just amazing how when God opens our eyes, it, it is God's and, doing. Yeah, yeah. That's what grace is. Yeah. It is God's work. I was dead. I was a dead man. And the dead can't raise themselves up. Yeah. God is the one that calls you forth like Lazarus. And he is the one that puts the life in you. And he's the one that turns your head. And he's the one that makes you believe. He even makes you believe. It's such a far cry from taking your whole life into your own hands and trying to get into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. Yeah. It, uh, well, and... And the answer, I don't know how you felt about what you finally decided about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon, and you started learning about those yeah, I found negative out. things, I guess. And it, it, The whole thing, the whole Mormonism from the very beginning is a lie. It's a lie, and it's deceived so many people. And I think the biggest disservice that Joseph ever did was the eighth article of faith, yeah. where we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly. Yeah. And it's just like the devil saying to Eve in the Garden of Eden, hath God said? Questioning God's Word. You start questioning God's Word. That's what, jo that's what Joseph had to do. He had to discredit the Word of God, and he had to get rid of the deity of Jesus Christ. 
just make him a man and make the Word of God unreliable. Yeah, he kept it so he could use certain scriptures out of it for his own his own. Yeah, that's profit. what we did, wasn't it? We just yeah. plucked and Well Adam, it's such a such a compelling story because God is and, and as we were kind of joking about a little bit earlier, what God had in mind. He, I don't know if he has a sense of humor, I assume he does, but he knew that you had some joyful moments ahead of you and but he Boy, took God, you on this journey of God has been so good to me. I love him so much. I love my Savior Jesus. Yeah. My God, Jesus. And he's given me a relationship with my wife now and he's making up the years that the locusts took. Yeah. And I I don't think of prison at all, hardly ever. And when I go to tell my story, it's very difficult for me to dig up the past of a dead man. Because it's... Because I'm a new creature in Christ, and yeah. I have a whole different perspective and outlook than what I had. You're going to a Christian church yeah. now? Yeah, uh, Ephraim Church of the Bible, great people, and what a wonderful thing it is to belong to fellow believers. This body of Christ, it is real. Yeah. And you notice the worship is so different. Oh, yeah. Boy, I love it. Praising Jesus yeah. always. Yeah, and our, our pastor, what an amazing person. He devotes all his his time, and he brings out the Word of God. Yeah. He expounds the Word of God, and his preaching is in accordance with the Bible, not the other way around. Yeah. It's, uh, so your prayer's changed a little bit, I would assume. Oh, yeah. From what you Yeah, know. well, my prayer changed in that prison. God take me and my family on a course of mercy. Please forgive me of that prayer. I was broken and I just cried out to God to be merciful. Um, and I found out His grace and it's wonderful. Yeah. And that burden was taken off my shoulders. The burden of having to do this work myself. The work was done. Jesus yeah, did it. Jesus paid for our sins, yeah. and He did that on the cross. And yeah, I don't think we appreciate that. As, and it's a burden. It's a, a bondage that yeah. the Mormons are in. They don't. They don't have the freedom. Grace. That, uh, and you understand bondage. And, oh yeah. And freedom and the differences. Yeah. Well, Adam, it's been a joy, and I hope our audience will take the time to to watch your other interviews and, and uh, get to know you a little we, bit better. We love your program. It. Well, thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you and, and Charlotte Swap next time. Bye. 